Can you remember who introduced you to Jesus? Can you remember when they did it? I know sometimes uh, when you talk with people, that might be some, kind of vague. You say, when was your, your Damascus Road moment? And they go, I don't know, approximately this age, this time. And, and while that might be true for some, I know vividly for me, it was February 22nd of 1993. I was eight years old. I was in the third grade. You know, I come from a divorced family, so single mom, little sister, doing the best my mom, she, doing my best my mom she, she could do. She took us to church, and I remember sitting in church one particular day and, and hearing about this gospel, and I, I remember I made a decision that day, and then all of a sudden later on that night, a guy by the name of Mike showed up to my house. What I knew about Mr. Mike was he was a deacon. I didn't know how to spell deacon. I didn't know what it was, okay? But Mr. Mike, the deacon, came over to my house, sat at our kitchen table, and as eight-year-old Jason starts hearing what Mr. Mike had to say to me, I was like, this is real stuff. And he said, Jason, can you explain to me the decision you just made? Now, what eight-year-old can really articulate the salvation uh, that just occurred? Now, some can, but I could not. And I said, Mr. Mike, I don't know how to tell you in words, but if I could, could I, could I draw it for you? I said, Mr. Mike, if I could, this was my life before Jesus, and I drew like a Valentine's Day-shaped heart. And I said, Mr. Mike, this was my life before Jesus, and then I met Jesus today, and I began coloring in my heart. I said, he's come in and he's given me a new heart. That was my moment. But I remember Mr. Mike talking with me, walking me through that, helping me understand and comprehend the significance of my salvation. And here I am at 40 years old, and it still sticks. What I want to remind us with that sticking point is, you're someone who's going to introduce so many students to Jesus, and then you're gonna be a part of their journey of leading their peers and their friends and their community to Jesus. The gospel moves at the speed of relationships, and that'll be the next slide. If you're taking notes, I hope you'll just jot, jot down some of these things or take some pictures, or even if you want me to send these slides to you later, I'm happy to do so. But the gospel moves at the speed of relationships. And I don't know if you heard or read that little bio in the, in the guide today, but it says that small group ministry can work to reach students and get them plugged into church. It's not just big events that draw them in, but relationships. So we're going to talk through practical ways to reach and involve students in ministry. 2 Timothy 4, 5, Paul is telling young Timothy here, do the work of a, an evangelist. Some of you, you have that gifting to be an evangelist. Some of you, you're like, I have no bone in my body that wants to talk with people, and I don't know how I'm doing it because you're the most introverted people. And I would just tell you that Paul is not saying you have to have the personality profile to do this. He's saying if the Spirit of God is in you and you've been bought with the blood, you've got everything you need. You may not have the gift of evangelism, but you have the calling and commissioning and the commandment from Jesus himself to evangelize and equip those that are entrusted to you. So, Let's do the work of an evangelist. I told you earlier, my son is in eighth grade, and one of the, the blessings I have as a dad, and so I take my pastor hat, pastor hat off for a moment, and I just put myself in the trenches of someone who's walking alongside this, this eighth grade boy, and it's been so fun over the past couple years to be able to walk around and sell school fundraising gold cards. I don't know what we have in your context, but something that helps the school fundraise money for football or band or whatever has got discounts for restaurants. You say, well, okay, how do, we, how do I take a 13-year-old, 14-year-old out into the, to, to the public to, to go sell these things that generate money for our school? And here's what, I, here's what I t I've told my son, and I, we've done this a couple years now, is that we have a lot of family that's not in Dallas, but they're in Houston. We have a lot of friends that are still in Houston. And while we've been in Dallas for six and a half years, I will leverage our social media and I'll say, hey, any family or friends who don't live in Dallas who want to buy a gold card from my son and will help us bless other people in our community and give them to them, here's what we promise you. If you buy one from us, we will gift it to somebody in our community and we will do so by saying, hey, someone bought this card for us to be able to give to you today. We'd love to give it to you and we'd love to know how we can pray for you. The first couple times we did this, I showed my son, I said, hey, let's walk into a couple of these restaurants that are on the card to go sell these things. And I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show you how to do this. So I took the first three to four times. He started noticing, I said, okay, the next time, it's yours. You get to do this. And we had about 15 cards last year to be able to do this. So we had ample time. I took the first, you know, third, the, the second, third, I'm right there with him, letting him do it and lead it. And finally, the last five, 
I, we literally would park in, we'd show up in the parking lot, park, and he'd go, hey dad, just stay in the car, I got it. And he would go into the restaurant, and he'd come back, sold them all, I said, how did it go? Did you get to pray with anybody? He goes, yeah, I got to pray with this, this grandma, I got to pray with the waitress today. And sometimes he's like, they just said thanks, and no, we're good, no prayer. But I said, well done, buddy, well done. Now we didn't just go show up to give cards and to pray with people, he knows that the prayer is a door to perhaps a gospel conversation. Because they might, why are you doing this? Ah, son, if they give you that opportunity, now's your time. So I tell you that, not to say you're a great dad. As a matter of fact, I would tell you a lot of stories that would tell you that I'm still learning to be a better father. I tell you that to say I'm in the trenches with, there, with you on how to engage people in their context to give them courage to go out and do it. Okay? I believe this to be true, that students can access a lot of information. You probably see it, you probably feel it, you probably know it. They can access a lot of information, but what they're not looking for is status quo answers. They're not looking for superficial responses. They're seeking beyond the service and they're looking for people and leaders who are constantly available. I love serving with people in our ministry. Uh, Mr. Al, he's 78 years old. And on the surface, you would look at Mr. Al and say, how in the world do students resonate with Mr. Al as a, as a, we call them life groups, as a life group Sunday school leader? How in the world could they resonate? You know what makes Mr. Al attractive? It's not because he he wears cool drip and wears J's, but he's constantly available and he loves those boys. He loves those boys. Mr. Al brings realness. That's what students need. They They need leaders who can help show them and understand the richness of God and the realness of a person's faith. They need to see the why and how lived out. This generation, they're digital natives who can reach people across the world in a matter of seconds, and they're committed to being part of great, they're committed to being part of something greater than themselves. So this is where we get to help walk into these students' lives to help them see the opportunity, help them understand the why and the influence they have to reach their peers. And so here's my prayer today, is I hope that you leave here uh, more as a, as a transformed leader, as, as just a trained leader. I, I pray today that perhaps the pebble in your shoe is to be the person who's not just trying to reach students to teach students, but someone who's convicted to say, how am I living on mission? To say, follow me as I follow Jesus. I hope today that you leave as a transformed leader, not just a trained one. We're gonna go from principle to practical, and where I wanna begin our lesson today, we're gonna jump to the next one, is that we're gonna go reach to teach through the four M's, okay? Uh, Mick is gonna read through the four M's. Make, we're gonna make sure that we're, everything we're gonna do is mission-centered, mission-focused, mission-advancing, uh, much like the key word that we just heard this morning opening up in our general session. Then we're gonna look at modeling. How do we model the mission with our students, for our students? How are we multiplying ourselves into the life of our students? And then how are we mobilizing our students? Uh, Just by a show of hands, how many of y'all are full-time church staff? How many of y'all are lay leaders? How many of y'all are bivocational? Okay, it looks like 70% of the room raise your hand as you're a, a lay leader, so you're not on church staff. Okay, which is awesome. Praise God for that. Uh, no matter who you are in the room, I believe that this is going to hit hit home for every single one of us today. All right, let's jump into our mission, the why. Okay, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is known as what? Y'all help me out. Great the Great Commission. Jesus is uh, marching orders for his disciples, and Jesus came and said to them, "How much authority?" All authority. You know what that word all means in the Greek? All. All. So Jesus himself is saying, all authority under heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Jason, I've heard this a thousand times. but sit in this just for a second. This is why we're here, right? To make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. What does Jesus tell us at the end of that statement? I will be with you to the very end of the age. If you're taking notes, if you're highlighting, if you're circling, a couple things I just want to point out to us today, the Great Commission is commissioning for you as well. Be reminded of that. 
be also reminded that it's not your, not your authority that you're walking in, not your strength that you're walking in. Whose authority and strength? Jesus. And finally, because it gets scary, I don't care if you're a pastor for 20 years or you're a small group leader for two months or two weeks, it can be nerve-wracking. It can be scary. Why in the world would Jesus add that statement on the very end of this commissioning statement? He knew. He says, I am with you. I hope today that the comfort of Christ allows you to walk in courage, to live out faithfully this commandment. But why is this important? We're going to the next slide. Why is it so important to make sure that everything we do is centered around making disciples? Now, again, I didn't know what kind of TV screens or room I was going to be in, so if you can't read it, again, I'll send you my slides. If you, if you ask me for it, I'll be happy to do it. But Barna showed us uh, a, a few years ago, churchgoers, have you heard of the Great Commission? And 51% responded with no. Let that sink in just for a second. I just asked you, what is Matthew 28? And you're like, oh yeah, the Great Commission. So this room knows it. Good job. You can get some more Starburst on your way out to celebrate. <laughs> you did it. But this would tell us that half the students in your group statistically have no clue what you're talking about. That's like saying, go fishing without a pole or bait. You're like, I... Yeah, we'll go fish, but what am I fishing with? I don't know what to do. So here's a question. Do your students actually know the Great Commission? Have you taught them the Great Commission? Have they memorized the Great Commission? Is it something that you talk about and replicate over and over again to the point where, all right, guys, let's talk about the Great Commission today. They're like, absolutely. We know it like the back of our hands, or are they second guessing? You got to ingrain it to them. We need our students graduating from our ministries, not just having heard about it, but infusing it into their lives and having been discipled by it. Because when they leave our ministries, what are they charged to do as followers of Jesus? This. This. There's another category here. Uh, do church goers recognize the Great Commission among other verses? And so just some, some fascinating details. Okay. The next slide. Here's another interesting statistic of why do they need to know the why. 47% of Christian teens say they definitely feel their church does a good job equipping them to share their faith with someone who is not a Christian. Now, this Barna study came out in 2021, a few years later than the previous slide. So here's what's interesting. You have churchgoers who have never heard of the Great Commissioning, and less than half of, their church, of the churches are actually equipping their people to go share the gospel. Fascinating. So if we're, not, if we're not seeing students reach with the gospel, we have to understand, are we training them to be mission-focused and mission-driven? If not, we've got to address that. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. And Jesus said, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had what? Compassion. Circle, underline that word. When he saw the crowds, he had great compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Oh, so we've got our commissioning, we have the commandment, we've got the harvest, right? Jesus saw that they were lost and he had compassion. So when we're looking at students in our communities and in our groups, and we look at those kids that we call the EGRs, they're the extra grace required students, that you're like, I do not have time or patience to deal with you today, Okay. You got students who are walking in from all sorts of different broken backgrounds and situations, and you're like, this is so infuriating. Yeah, Jesus said, have compassion. That's beyond the bless your heart. That's, that's saying, no, I want to help step into your junk in your life and meet you right where you're at. Not with condemnation, but with compassion. Y'all, that's hard. But you have to have that filter on. Jesus saw the, the harvest with compassion. I got to see my group with great compassion. I have to understand their family dynamic with incredible depth and demeanor and discernment. Here's, here's a question I'd ask you. 
Do y'all know your harvest in your context? Like when I say, do you know your harvest? I want to go to this next slide here for a moment. I want to give you just an overview of the context of my harvest. From where our church is located in Plano, in a 10-mile radius, we have 96,000 junior high and high school students. It blows your mind, doesn't it? 96,000. Now, again, you do demographic studies in your own city and context. I was learning this morning, we got Benton High School right across the street. I mean, that could be an easy one. Like, you can find that information real fast. I also just went to Google Maps, and I pinpointed the high schools and the middle schools in our area. And I did this so I can understand the harvest that's around me and the opportunity that is around me. Now, am I crazy enough to think that we can reach all 96,000? Yeah, I kind of am. I got a little screw loose in there, okay? But it's that fuel, that fire, that that sense of urgency of going, Lord, how how can we? Show me. You know what I also know? There's other great Bible-believing churches in our community. I'm not alone. You know, the churches in your, your community are not your competition. Can I say it louder for the people in the back? The churches in your community are not, they're not the competition, y'all. I've got such great relationships with people in our city. And if if a student comes to one of our events and I've got a decision information, I'm like, dude, you need to follow up over here. Right? But do you know the opportunity? Do you know where your harvest is? Because if you know where the harvest is too, you're going to be showing up strategically. You're going to be praying specifically. You're going to be sending strategically. What I also know to be true is it is impossible for me to get on every single one of the school campuses. It's impossible for you as a pastor or as a lay leader to get foot on a campus or all those campuses. Hmm, interesting. So how in the world are we going to reach more students if we're limited within our harvest? I don't think we're limited in our harvest. I think we have a unique opportunity. We'll go to the next slide. And I want to show you this because how in the world can we get onto all those school campuses? I can't, but our students are. You're like, so hold on a minute. We don't have to have this huge, large event to, to reach the thousands or the hundreds to see people come to faith. I'm not saying you don't have to. I'm saying those have a time and a place and do them, do them accordingly. But on the week to week, your students are in the greatest mission field they've ever got. Do they know that? Have you articulated that to them? Have you told them that wherever your feet are, there your mission field is? Have you been able to articulate and tell them that the gospel moves at the speed of relationships, so build relationships with people, be winsome to people? But I also want to make sure that our students understand what Jesus saw, the compassion. Hey, student, are you broken and burdened for the lost to the point where you're praying for them? This is a picture of one of our students in front of our Revive board. This is something we keep in our, in our room as a constant visual reminder of this great commission to make disciples. I didn't invent this. I believe it was Nam who a half a dozen years ago came out with something very similar to it. We just adopted it and tweaked it. The white ping pong ball represents a name uh, of an individual that our students are praying for. That's their one. They're, I'm praying for this person to come to faith in Jesus Christ. So we tell our students, write down the first name or the initials of that individual and drop it in. Now, you may add to that list, but you're going to be fervently praying for that person to to meet Jesus. The green, green means go, right? As you go and as you have gospel conversations, write down the name of the person you had a gospel conversation with or their initials and drop it in. You see, the idea here is to go from a lot of white ping pong balls to a lot of green ping pong balls. What do the white and green have in common? Things that we can control. We can, we can dictate how much we pray. We can dictate how much we share. But now we move into the orange. This is the work of God. Orange signifies, did you see someone come to faith in Jesus? If they did, write their name down, put it in. Blue is, were they baptized? Hey, you got to lead someone to Jesus. Are you helping them walk in obedience and by faith now and getting them plugged in? If so, let's... Let's see that. And I love this board. We dump it out two times a year. We're about to dump it out again next week. And we hit restart, just refresh. And we do, it's just a visual reminder. 
Do your students see a visual reminder of this great commission and how it can play out? Do they see themselves as a part of it? Do they see themselves as the laborers in the mission field? Do they have the compassion of Christ and that burden, that pebble in their shoe that just keeps them a little uncomfortable to say, hold on a minute, I need to pray for the lost. Hold on a minute. Uh, My sports team is not just a place for me to achieve great accomplishments. My sports team is the mission field that Christ has compelled me to to be in and the coach to to pour out and share Jesus with and to, to talk with my teammate or orchestra or band or whatever it might be. Do our students see like Jesus saw the people? Do they have compassion for their peers? And dare I say, we have to help our students understand if we're going to reach more students, we have to teach them this level of compassion. Do do they understand the significance of prayer? Do they understand the significance of soul winning? I think we got to keep it in front of them time and time again. When and where. Wherever your feet are, there your mission field is. So that's our mission. Next slide. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. This is our model now. Paul told Timothy, you as you're shepherding and discipling your students, you're saying the same thing. Our life is to be a model, not a perfect one, but a work in progress. And we're, we should be telling our students Follow me as I follow Jesus. Follow my example. Hey, leaders, this is where we have to stop telling students what to do and start telling them what you do. Did you catch that? Start, stop telling them what to do and start telling them what you do. I was intentional in my first 12 minutes of here of trying to demonstrate to you what I do, correct? To get to this point, to help illustrate and gird it. Stop telling students how to pray and start telling them how you pray. Pray frequently and consistently with and for students. Stop telling students how to read their Bible and start telling them how you read your Bible. It's tough, isn't it? If you get to your small group on Sunday and you're asking them, all right, tell me about what God was teaching you this week. In your heart of hearts, you're sitting there thinking, I didn't crack my Bible open once. Or maybe I got to it when it was convenient. It's convicting, isn't it? But it's hard to tell people what to do if you yourself are not doing it. Pause for a second. I'm going to chase a rabbit. This is a message I just preached this past Wednesday. If you're hiding behind the mask of leadership hypocrisy, I want to remind you to take off the mask. Don't hide behind the shame of your sin and your failures and your shortcomings. Recognize it, ask for forgiveness, put aside the mask and walk in the light that Jesus has called you to walk into, not the spiritual darkness. It's hard to lead people in the light of Christ if you're not living the light yourself. But you don't have to hide in darkness. God's not there to just beat you up. He's saying, come here. He's called you to this. He'll carry you you through it. Lay Lay down the mask and walk in that grace of Jesus. When you do, When you do, uh, there's the true ministry. Now the overflow is your ministry. The overflow of your walk with Jesus. Be reminded of that today. I'm going to jump back in. Stop telling students to have healthy relationships and start telling them how you seek to have healthy relationships. Show them. Model it. Students don't need a motto to say. They need a motto to follow. That's the next slide. They don't need a motto to say. They need a model to to follow. They're looking to you. They're watching you. I don't know if you recall being a junior high or high school student and the people that you looked up to. You probably don't remember a whole lot of the things that they taught you. You might, but you remember a lot of their availability, their presence, how they made you feel, how they challenged you and how to think. So we have to model for our students more than we're just speaking. People are more likely to trust you based on actions and words. 89% of of what people learn comes through visual stimulation, 10% through audible stimulation, and 1% through other senses. So students are watching you and learning about who you are. And if you want to lead people well, live a life worth following. This will lead us to our next slide. To multiply and mobilize. Disciple and equip students to be fishers of men. Don't just meet for holy huddles. 
We're not just here for social gatherings and, and donut sharing and kumbaya, okay? We are discipling students and equipping students to be fishers of men. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.12, what? Equip the saints for the ministry. Equip the students. Equip them. You're like, well, I'm not seminary trained. Do you know Jesus? Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? You got a Bible? You got enough. On top of that, you might have a church staff that supports you. You might have a community that loves you. You might have other parents that come alongside you and support you and encourage you. But even if you didn't have any of those things, your leadership in equipping the saints is not circumstantial. It's concrete in the, in the power of Jesus. So be faithful as a leader to equip the saints. Each and every single one of your life groups, equip the saints. You can do it through your life groups. You can equip the saints through a student leadership team, okay? This is throwing me off not being able to control my slides. You can, um, methodology with the three circles, share days, and, and what we call starting point. Let me walk you through some of these real quick. We're gonna go to the next slide if we can. So if we're gonna equip the saints, how do we do it, okay? The three circles, how many of y'all have heard of the three circles? Three circle method, okay? How many of y'all use that in a practical way? Very cool. I know there's a lot of different methods that we can get to, but the bottom line is, do your students have a method in which you're training them with? Like to the point where when you show up to your small group or life group, could they walk you through that? If it was like a pop quiz, a pop quiz Sunday, right? And you got a stash of donuts underneath your chair they don't know about or some Starburst. And you're like, okay, pause, time out, pop quiz. And you call someone by name, you're like, all right, I don't know Jesus. Share with me. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? See how they do. Now, hopefully you already, you've fostered a, a great culture and environment where students can trust you and they know you love them. You're not out to just like hammer them. If, if not, build that first. <laughs> okay? Build that first. We get to a point and say, hey, let's talk about the three circles and boom, on the spot, go for it. Do you ever take a time in your life group, your small group to say, all right, guys, for the next five minutes, pair up with someone and practice three circles with one another? What a great environment right? Their walls should already be down a little bit. They should be already kind of engaged. There might be a trusted peer or two in the group that they're like, there's some familiarity here and some comfort. If they can practice it in a safe place, it'll help prepare them when they're not as comfortable. Get out of the boat type moments, right? Hey, I'll be with you to the very end of the age type moments. But let them get them training wheels on so that eventually they can take them off. Give them a place to practice. I would say use the three circle method. Now, we have something that we, we have infused over the last few years called share days in our student ministry. Uh, we capitalized specifically in the summertime. This past summer, we did four planned ones. And throughout the year, the school year, we try to do one or two a semester depending. Now, sometimes our students will go do this unbeknownst to us, unplanned by us. They just want to go do it. Praise God. Okay. Now, here are three of the four different share days of, of groups of pictures. What was really fun at the top one, it was my son's first one that he got to go on. Really cool dad moment, by the way. And I, we just showed up to a, a public mall. And the other ones, we just picked other random places in the community. We have the students meet us at the church. We shuttle them. Sometimes they just meet us there if they're in high school. We pair up the students who have done it before with some, some rookies. The ones who are like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, right? <laughs> It's, it's sweet. It's endearing. There'll be some staff people strategically placed around, and they know they can come, like, get us if, if they need us. But we sent them out two by two. Seems like that's found in the Bible somewhere. Now, I did grow up in Salt Lake, so I'm a little familiar with my Mormon friends. <laughs> but they go out, sometimes three. And you know what? They just walk around the mall saying... Hey, I'm, I'm an eighth grade student just down the road and I'm with some of my friends. We're literally just trying to encourage people today and just want to know, how can we pray for you today? When was the last time someone just randomly walked up to you and asked you that question? Probably a hot minute if, if ever. Let me ask you this question. If a teenager walks up to you as an adult and asks you that question, <laughs> hold on a minute. A lost person might just be looking for that kind of a hope. A skeptic might be curious 
begin asking questions. You're going to have, you have the four soils, no doubt about it. You got some people like, I'm good. Thank you. Great. What are we teaching our students through the entire process? Be willing, be available. Don't be discouraged when you get rejected. Build perseverance. Oh, man, I'm saying, scripture. Perseverance produces character, godliness. Oh, man. Remember, we have a microwave culture that wants things quick and easy, and they, if they don't get what they want, when they want, how they want, like everything the Burger King, then they just take their ball and go home and say, this is too tough. I don't want to do it. Shut up and toughen up. In the name of Jesus, I'm not just going to tell you that. I'm going to show you how to do that. You're going to face rejection. It's okay. It's okay. How do you deal with it? How do you process that? This right here is the training lab. I can't think of a better way to launch students to reach people with the gospel than just go do it. Don't just talk about it. Be about it. I, I don't know about you, but if it's not on my calendar, it does not exist. Do you operate, some of you all operate like that? Okay. If I don't plan for it, it probably is just not going to happen. It's probably just not going to happen. So I've got to be strategic. I've got to make time. I've got all the time in the world. Y'all got as enough time as God has given you. Amen? You've got, a, you've got all the time in the world. God has entrusted you with every single hour of the days. How are you going to be faithful with your minutes? How are you going to plan and prioritize? Okay? So we've got the three circles. We've got share days. And then the next slide we're going to disciple our students. And so what, what this is is, is is our starting point discipleship curriculum. It's six sessions designed to be over six weeks. And I, and I share this with you, and if you want access to it, that QR code will actually take you to the PDF. You can take it, you can copy and paste and make it your own and say you did it, all good. We don't care. Use it. But I want to point this out to you. It's like this isn't just for students who recently make a decision to come to follow Jesus, we use this with every single one of our student leaders because we view our student leaders as an extension of our staff. Do you view students in your life group as an extension of you and your ministry and the church's ministry? Like, disciple them. The sixth session in this particular week is to then go make disciples. Funny, huh? You know, there's... What is faith? How do I pray? How, do I, how can I trust the Bible? There's some good stuff. But the last one is, okay, now you're up. Your turn. Go be a fisher of men. You're like, hold on a minute. You're going to entrust a seventh grader to go lead other people to Jesus? 100%. Why not? Why not? Again, they have the Holy Spirit in them. What are we waiting for? They've been changed. They've got a testimony. Let them go. Are they going to skid their knee? Sure. Are they going to fumble? Yeah. Isn't our God bigger than all that? Let's go. Train them. Equip them. Do it with them. But give them something to work with. Show them. Map it out. Disciple them. Shane Pruitt, good friend of mine, he said, don't dummy it down. Disciple them up. I did my whole doctoral work on student leadership. If you have not read the book, Do Hard Things by Brett and Alex Harris, two twins, blow your mind. In a simple, practical way, two teenage boys decided they were going to rebel against society's expectations on them and raise the bar. Your students can and want to do hard things. Disciple them up. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, I think, yeah, I've talked about student leadership. Just a small training we had this, this past month. We do two trainings, and if you, get, you want to talk more, shop on all that, we can talk offline. Okay, reach to teach. Mission, model, multiply, and mobilize. I got some other stuff I would love to, to talk about. Uh, I'm going to put this aside, and I'm going to finish up our last five minutes. I believe we've got five minutes or so before we need a break. Um, so five minutes to answer any questions, any thoughts that you guys have um, that, that we can help with or discuss.